Thanks everyone for coming too. This has been a, a big effort putting on this conference and it's really fulfilling for me to see so many people show up here and I'm, I'm glad everyone's here and enjoying it. Um, thanks. Um, okay, so basically what I wanted to do in this talk is essentially just give an overview of this issue. I'm gonna try to provide um, sort of like a map or a framework. I'm not really, I'm not really trying to um, advocate or anything for one specific thing. I just kind of find this concept interesting and there's a lot of, it gets into lots of little nitty gritty connected details. So I think it's uh, just like touches on various things. Basically the background context is, um, you know, back in November when Bitcoin ABC and the various teams released their plans for the roadmap, those things in there that, you know, everyone kind of seems obvious, like let's raise the block size limit again and Let's reactivate opcodes. Um, but then there was this, this other thing written in there. Let's move towards canonical transaction order, maybe removing the ordering, current order rule um, as a first step, which seems kind of like I think a lot of people weren't really aware of this, or it seems kind of like it just came out of left field. Like, what is this, this topic? Why are they talking about this? Um, so that's basically what I'm going to try to go over today, kind of like touch on what this is all about. Um, it's an interesting topic because it gets into all kinds of details of how, how things work in the theory and also just how it's implemented. This is my kind of mental concept. Hopefully you guys can understand this diagram. So basically the little box, the little squares are supposed to be transactions. And at the top, that's kind of like what, I guess we'd probably imagine what the blockchain looks like. It's a bunch of transactions. They're put into Merkle trees, the Merkle roots in the block header. The block headers all point back to each other, forming a chain. Um, and that puts a timestamp on transactions. But there's also another way that the transactions are connected together. Each transaction has pointers to the outputs from other transactions so that when you spend the money, it points to where that money came from, essentially. So this, this proves that it's essentially a, I guess I call it the causal DAG in this diagram. It's a, it's a directed acyclic graph. So it's, it all goes in one direction. And it proves that you know, when you spend the money, it's based on where the money was before. And then it all has, to pro, all, has to prop, all has to make sense in time. So you can't spend the money if it wasn't there previously. Um, and these are all connected through, through hashes. Of, of the input, of the outputs and the transactions and so on. So basically the way that the way that the transactions are validated currently is that's what that big black arrow represents. It, it essentially just scans through and then you have a you have a UTXO, so you know all your unspent outputs and you scan through each transaction one after the other and say like okay this one spends these outputs, those exist, so this is valid and we move on to the next one and so on and so forth. Um, so basically what the effect of that is, is that if, if you think about how, if you look at the lower level where they're connected together in a causal way, you can't, you can't rearrange one. You can't, if you come to one, like if you change the order of two, of one that spends the other, when you, if you just scan through linearly like that, when you get to it, you'll say like, oh, this, this output doesn't exist, so therefore this is invalid, and then the whole thing will fail. So what that means is that the transactions, there is a, there's a partial ordering enforced in the, in the Merkle tree, like in the top part, so that those transactions, they don't have to be, like you can change the order of the ones that aren't dependent on each other in a causal way, but the ones that are have to be in order. So it's, it's basically this partial ordering requirement. Um, and it's, it's basically unclear, like it's something that's essentially due to how it's implemented. There's no real reason why the, why the transactions should be in order other than that if you don't do it, you'll fail when you validate it. So if you start, and this becomes if more important when you think about how do, how do you parallelize this? Like right now I'm talking to you scan through linearly one after the other. So what do you, want, what do, you do if you want to parallelize validation? It's sort of a, it's sort of a little weird 
a weird, it seems backwards, but, but the way you do it is if you want a batch, I just showed two, two batches here, but you, in theory, could have many batches. So you just take bunches of transaction. The first thing you do is you just add the outputs in. You don't check the inputs. So you can do that in parallel. You can have the UTXO set in all your little parallel processes. You can just add the outputs to the UTXO. Then you can do a second parallel um, process where then you go, go back to the inputs and check all the inputs against it. And you can, de and you can that, it's basically something that's parallelizable. And then there's, right now, you'd have to do a step three if you wanted to do this, which is to, because those two steps don't check that order that I talked about. So you could have transactions in the, in the Merkle tree where the one that spends the other one is, is before it, like it's to the left there in the Merkle tree. Um, so basically, if you do it this way, that's step three. The only reason you would do that is so that the old way would also still work. But if you're gonna do it this way, it makes no sense. Like it's just a completely pointless step. Um, and, it's, and it's linear, like you can't parallelize that because it's, it's this causal chain. So you need to check it. It's like a, a time dependent thing. So you need to check it through time. Oh yeah, one note. The way when you add these, when you do it this way, when you do the outputs first and then connect the inputs after, you're not explicitly checking that the inputs come from a previous thing, a previous transaction, but the only way it couldn't is if you break to uh, the SHA-256. So you're basically assuming it's like a sort of an additional assumption, but I, I mean, I think we can assume that SHA-256 is valid or else we have bigger problems. Um, okay, so basically up till now I've said, okay, let's get rid of this order requirement. We'll, we'll just put the transactions in any order you want and you can parallelize the thing. So what does canonical order mean? Like canonical means there's, a, there's an order that it has to be in. It's not this partial order. So, that, so uh, that sounds kind of contradictory. Like I've just told you guys, hey, let's get rid of the order and then you can parallelize it. Now what, what's this canonical order we're talking about? Um, Basically, the canonical order would be an order. I guess. I guess what I say here is the what I call the causal order. That depends on the relationships between the transactions. So, it's if you look at two transactions, you don't really know what order they would go in unless you knew the relationships between them and if one spends the output of the other. So, that's very difficult to um, to do in parallel. Whereas if you have a sorted order, like if you have transactions, say they're sorted by the hash of the transaction, for example, you can just look at two transactions and say, yeah, but you're looking at just those two, we know that they're in the correct order with respect to each other. Or you can have two sorted lists and say this list and that list um, are in the correct order because we can just check, check that the ends, that you know, if you know it's all in order within it, um, it, it's very easy and it's easy to combine them also. Uh, I think that was all I had to say there. So why would you want to do this? Basically, um, the advantage of it is that you don't have to deal with, there's several advantages, which is interesting. Like the main one that, ever, that a lot of people talk about is this block, block propagation, because if you do this, if, as long as you have this set of transactions, you don't need to know what order they're in. That's why I wrote in this box. It's kind of a weird way to, like the way you can think about it if you want to is canonical order for anything where you're, where you're not building the Merkle tree, you don't have to worry about the order. So there isn't, it's just a set of transactions and the only time you, you need to think about the order is when you're doing the part that the order depends on. For everything else, it doesn't matter. So when you're trans, transmitting them across the network, all you have to do is provide the information of which transactions are in the block and then every time it will, the, the Merkle tree will get built the same way and will have the same um, root. Um, another interesting thing about this is, I mentioned the sorted aspect. So this allows proof of absence. So for example, if you know the transaction ID of a transaction, you can prove, if that transaction's not in the block, you can provide a compact proof that that's not in the block. Um, so you can basically look at two adjacent transactions in the Merkle tree and if, if one is higher and one is lower than the value that you're concerned about, you know that the value that's between those is not there because that's the only place it could be because it has to be in that order. Um, so this is useful for things like sharding 
or, or fraud proofs where you might want to um, have compact proofs of, of absence of transactions. Um, anyway, yeah, I guess, my, I guess this is what I'm talking about. Like, for most things, it just means you don't have to worry about ordering. So for block propagation and stuff like that, it removes all that. The only time you have to worry about it is when you're, validate, or when you're validating the way the Merkle root is in, is in the header. OK. Now I'm just going to touch on a few minor details. One thing is, what should the order be? It, the Merkle tree is built out of transaction hashes. So you hash the, all the information, and you, you know, and then you combine it into a Merkle tree. Um, one sort of interesting thing is you can think like, well, should that be the order? Should you just order them by the transaction hash? And you could, like, it's just an it's just a arbitrary number basically, and it's something. But if you look at things like, in the like, for example, Thomas who just presented his malfix proposal. It, that takes apart these two concepts of the transaction hash and the ID. Um, so if you go to that, maybe I should just flip to that other slide. Like if you go to this one, the bottom part would be connected by the ID because that's the part where you need the ID, you need a unique identifier of each transaction. But for the, but for the blockchain, you want the transaction hash of all, of all the data in the transaction. Um, to be, to be what's used to build that tree because you're timestamping the information. So you need to have proof that that information existed at that point in time. Um, so anyway, so you can basically separate these two concepts of the, the transaction ID and the transaction hash. And maybe it makes more sense to order it by transaction ID because that's what the trans, if you're gonna do absence proofs, that's what you wanna be able to prove is that the inputs are absent. So anyway, there's just, that's just uh, one of the details. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I'm almost done. So I guess, I guess kind of my conclusion is that it's unclear, like right now everything works fine. This is more of a, of a laying the groundwork kind of thing. Um, it, it's sort of unclear, there's various options. One option is, okay, we maintain the status quo, we have this partial ordering, which is causal. It seems sort of not the most elegant thing, but it works and it's easy to make it, we could easily scale, you know, probably many orders of magnitude with the way things are now. You can do the removing the ordering, which allows you to parallelize, or you can move to this canonical ordering. Um, I mean, the, and the downside, I guess, is that the, the easy, the simple sort of naive implementation, if you remove the ordering, then that doesn't really work anymore. You have to do some kind of parallelizable um, method. And do, yeah, and the other thing is it's kind of interesting. It's one of these things where it seems like it touches on random unrelated areas like block propagation um, and these fraud proof <laughs> ideas. So it's, it's one of these things that it seems like it's a, a sort of fundamental building block type, type of thing. Um, so it's just sort of like one of those things that's kind of a sign that um, maybe it's an interest, like an important thing to think about and it lays the groundwork for a lot of stuff that we might want to do in the future. Anyway, I think that's all I have to say for now. If anyone has any questions. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony, that was awesome. Questions from the audience for Anthony? Uh, and I have a quick question. Okay, sure. so what inspired you to look at block ordering um, and then canonical ordering as, as you know, partially inspiration for this presentation? Like, what happened? Uh, I don't know, that's a good question. I think I just, find the, I just found it interesting as a concept. I just like to understand how, how it works and, um, yeah, I don't know. It's hard to say. <laughs> it's more just out of my own interest in understanding how it all works. And when I heard, heard talk of it, I was like, what are they talking about, basically? Yes. Uh, yeah, Peter Ojo here. Uh, okay. Thanks for the uh, beautiful presentation. Um, you mentioned that this is mainly laying the groundwork for now. Yeah. Uh, but if I could 
ask you to look through your own crystal ball. What would you think would be the commercial applicability of this? There has to be um, a spe specific reason why this is of interest to you. Well, I mean, the applicability is that it allows potentially massive scaling in the future. Well, like, you know, we're talking if, if we're masked like 100 times, 1,000 times, or whatever, or more than current transaction rates, that's basically what this would enable. So you could have th like things like parallelizing, maybe sharding, so where you have, you know, you can break up, instead of having one node that validates everything, you can have nodes that validate subsections and can prove, or can at least prove if there's a problem in the subsection that they're validating. So it's basically what can allow a Bitcoin Cash to scale to, you know, like 100 times visa levels or something like that type of thing. Maybe, I don't know. It's, there's different opinions on it, so I'm just trying to like kind of explain the concepts. But I think it's, there's a lot of interesting ideas in there. Hi. Yeah. Um, on that point, actually, I, th I think another way to think about it is in terms of the complex computational complexity of, of the scaling, yeah. um, and in terms of something like big O notation, for example. So this feels like it could actually change the big O complexity of uh, verification. Do yeah. you f feel the same way, or have you looked at that at all? Well, it reduces, I mean, it, it lowers it down because it makes you everything, and I'm not sure about, like basically right now it's like O-N, yeah. like as you grow, and this would lower most things down to log. like O log N yeah. or something like that. Exactly, that's, the, the, and that's yeah. what's exciting about it. Yeah, that's so, so basically, yeah, that's exactly, that's basically kind of, I guess, another way of answering the previous question is that it, once you get, like, like once you get to a certain level, it it allows you to keep growing um, without massively uh, running into resource limits. CPU resources, for example. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Um, mine has changed the thirty-two bit nines to. Um, get the, the resulting hash. Yeah. And they can run through those 32 bits incredibly quickly. Yeah. And then to further change that, they change the orders of the transaction. Mm -hmm. Will this ever change that? How will miners be able to do that? Well, I mean, you would just need to do something else other than changing the order. There's lots of ways you can change something in the Merkle, in one of the transactions. Um, okay. I mean, you could put it, I mean, I don't know. I can think of like random things off the top of my head, but they, yeah, they would just have to grind something else. You could, so I don't, I don't know. Okay, thanks. But yeah, that, that would affect that, that's for sure. Anyone want to take the last question of the day? Who wants the last question of the day? Come on now. I can ask it. So do you anticipate this being something that's uh, relatively easy to switch to in Bitcoin Cash, or should it be deployed on you know, something else to try it out? Uh, I don't know. Um, I mean, I don't think it's that, I don't think it's, conceptually it's not that hard to do. It's just a matter of making sure it plays well with, with all the pieces that connect in there. Like, for example, this doesn't affect SPV clients at all. Everything is the same. It's just the transactions, I mean, are, are in a different order. But when you get your Merkle, treat, Merkle paths to them and all that stuff, that would all be the same. Um, I mean, obviously, it's, it's like a fundamental change to, what's, to how things are working. So you'd have to test, be very careful and make sure it's well tested and implemented. But, um, conceptually, it's not, it's nothing too crazy, so I don't know if that answers the question, but. <laughs> and with that, let's give a round of applause to Anthony Ziggers, and a round of applause to us. Thank you very much.